Okay, so then our next speaker from the fire team is Dr. Ann Anderson. And uh, she's coming to us from Baylor College of Medicine. And as she mentioned before, she is a neurologist and she's also an epileptologist and she runs the epilepsy clinic there. So she will be talking to you today about her work on the fire team and I'll just turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? No? Let's see. I'll move it closer. Is that better? Is that better? I guess I'll hold it. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, and as I pointed out earlier and, and Becky highlighted, I'm both a clinician and a researcher. My focus uh, clinically is epilepsy. Um, and actually, I, I run the epilepsy monitoring unit, which is an inpatient unit, and clinical neurophysiology, which is primarily ambulatory EEG, so EEG for outpatients or EEG in the hospital setting. And in that context, both in the EMU as well as um, doing EEGs, I see a lot of Angelman patients and uh, struggle with their EEG and their epilepsy along with their families and the patient themselves. I was recruited to the Fast Fire team, um, I think primarily by Ed Weber. Ed and I had overlapped during our postdoctoral period at Baylor College of Medicine and Dave Sweat's lab. And that was at the time when Ed was um, um, getting involved in the Angelman research and did a lot of his early um, work identifying signaling pathway dysregulation in the Angelman mice. Um, at that time, I was learning signaling pathway dysregulation and building an epilepsy research program. But until I got recruited to the Fast Fire team, I had not worked specifically in Angelman syndrome research. So I didn't have the mice up and running in my lab. And so we spent a lot of the early period of our funding with the Fast Fire uh, team actually getting the mice up and running in our lab. And I'm go I, I think uh, this audience, I know you're very sophisticated and probably many of you know that there are struggles um, with these animal models and both um, the other speakers, Ed and Scott, have alluded to that, which is why the, the team has been seeking alternative models to the mouse, including um, the pig model, and we're really excited about that development. Part of the frustration with the mice is that it appears there's some variability in, their, in the, the Angelman phenotype, and it depends on their background strain in part. So um, that was part of the struggle we dealt with in my lab, and it became such that we ended up um, evaluating the behavioral phenotype and seizure phenotype in, in different strains of the mice, and it, it was really a lot of work uh, for us, but we ended up with some interesting results and results now that we can move on with in terms of uh, screening these animals. My lab is really, the expertise is in neurophysiology, EEG, epilepsy, and different seizure models, um, in, induced seizure models. Um, but we ended up doing behavioral screening, and, and my lab does some behavior um, in the context of epilepsy, but we really um, looked to Ed's group to help guide those studies, but we felt like it was important to do them because that's such an important phenotype in Angelman and also in the mice. So we wanted to make sure that we had mice expressing the, the deletion that actually had a behavioral phenotype like what's seen in Ed's lab and other labs. So I'll talk to you about that in the beginning of my talk, or most of my talk, and then at the end, once we had, had phenotyped these animals, then we used them to screen one of the compounds of interest that had been used in several other um, neurodevelopmental disorders. And then I'll just talk to you a little bit about what our uh, future thoughts are. Next slide. 
So um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this uh, slide, and, and the other speakers have already um, discussed this, but I just want to highlight the importance of preclinical studies, such as those that are funded by Fast Fire. We really can't translate to the bedside, to our human um, individuals that are affected by a given disorder without these preclinical studies. They're important, one, to identify novel targets to develop um, pharmaceuticals against or genetic manipulations against. Um, but also, these studies are required to screen compounds that we're interested in in part because we need to know they worked in an animal model before we take a, a, an agent to then treat a human, especially children with, but also because our, our regulatory boards, which include the FDA and the institutional review boards at our given institutions, they require that we cite the preclinical studies, the basic science that support what we want to do, what we want to take to the bedside. So this is just one of the early studies um, that uh, um, from Art Baudet's lab defining that really characterized the phenotype of these mice. And they're those mice that then other labs, including Dave and, and Ed, went on to further characterize in terms of uh, signaling pathway dysregulation and further characterizing the phenotype. But they, they recapitulated a number of the features of Angelman, um, which I think you know, the motor dysfunction, cognitive deficits, but also there were reports that these animals had startle-induced seizures. And actually, I, I was, we were just next door to Art's lab when, when we were postdocing with Dave Sweat, and um, I went to the animal facility with his postdocs and, and actually saw those seizures. So this is just an overview of the studies um, that, that, or an, over, an overview of, of the studies um, and, and related to what we see in Angelman syndrome. So we were interested in abnormal EEG activity in the mice. We know that uh, children and adults with Angelman syndrome have abnormal EEG activity, um, even when they're not having active seizures. So we were interested in evaluating that in the mice. We wanted to look for seizures in epilepsy, both spontaneous seizures, evaluating whether these mice actually had epilepsy, but also doing um, uh, convulsant-induced seizures, like you heard um, work from uh, Ed's lab with the canate induction in the animals. And we were also wanted to look at abnormal behavior um, that's been reported in the animals previously, and we wanted to make sure that in our hands we saw these deficits, um, and of course, uh, cognitive impairment as well as abnormal social behavior is um, a, a part, uh, often a part of the Angelman syndrome phenotype, and then to evaluate to use these as markers that we could then evaluate. Um, whether therapeutics um, that we're interested in preclinically um, had an effect on these abnormalities. So what we did in terms of EEG is that we looked at baseline EEG activity both just with visual inspection, so that's a qualitative evaluation, and then we use spectral frequency analysis, which gives us a quantitative uh, evaluation of the EEG and allows us to do statistics on the differences between wild type and AS mice. We looked for spontaneous EEG um, evidence of epileptiform activity, and that's using visual inspection. And then we looked at uh, convulsant-induced seizure threshold. So this is basically the setup we use for the studies I'm going to show you today. We also have a telemetry system up and running now. We're just getting uh, monitoring our first animals with that. But this system um, is one that involves implanting electrodes, which you would also do with the telemetry system. And basically, we implant electrodes on the left and right side, both on the cortical surface but also in the depths, in the hippocampal depths. And we get EEG activity. 
we plug the animal into um, a, an, a, a thread of electrodes that then is hooked to a commutator. So when the animal moves around, that electrode chain um, or thread of electrodes moves as well so it doesn't get tangled up. And they can be monitored continuously for days on end in the system. They have food and water in, in the cage. So what I put on this slide is, is human um, EEG. So what's shown here is an EEG trace from a normal individual. Um, the blue is left and the red is right, and it goes front to back. So these are more frontal, central, and then occipital electrodes left and right. And what you see is this really nice modulated EEG activity. There's a, an occipital dominant rhythm, which is normal, and then pretty fast frequencies anteriorly as well. And then these are two examples of EEG traces from uh, individuals with Angelman syndrome. And what you see here is this very typical pattern in the frontal regions of the brain, left and right. There's this high amplitude slow activity. And then you can see there's some tiny spikes intermixed. And then the, the pattern in the EEG trace below just shows a diffuse theta pattern. So it's slow and it's different from what you see normally, but it doesn't show the spike activity that you see here. Both examples of abnormal EEG activity. So what we found in our mice, the wild type traces are here from the cortex and the hippocampus, and the AS mouse tracing is shown here, cortex and hippocampus, and what you can see is that the uh, wild type mouse has this well-modulated background activity. It was similar to what you saw in the human in the posterior regions. This is more typically seen in the mouse in the hippocampal regions. And this corresponds to an awake animal that is involved in exploring and a behaving animal. And then what you see is a disruption of this pattern and a lot of slower frequencies in the hippocampus and in the cortex of the mouse. And what we wanted to do is quantify this. So visually you can see it's different, but we wanted to quantify it and be able to do statistics on it. And we felt this would be one biomarker that we could use to, to gauge the, um, the effects of a therapeutic agent. So what we looked at was total power of all the frequencies combined. We looked at slow activity delta frequencies. We looked at theta, which is 5 to 8 hertz, or 5 to 8 cycles per second. Alpha, which is 8 to 13. Beta, which is a bit faster. And then gamma frequencies, which were even faster. And these correspond to various um, behaviors and abnormalities. An increase in deltas associated with disorders in sleep and, and developmental disability. Theta and alpha both are involved in uh, learning and memory and attention. Um, auditory processing, you'll see an increase in beta frequencies. And then, um, again, attention and object um, recognition with, uh, with gamma frequencies. So the spectral analysis can be correlated with behavior, which would be another interesting um, uh, component of, of looking at rescue with various um, agents. So what we found is that the black six Angelman mice, whoops, had an increase in um, total power. The Angelman um, 129, uh, animals did not show a difference, whereas the black six did. So an increase in total frequency spectrum. And then we looked at the individual frequencies, and what we found is that there was an increase both in delta, theta, and then the gamma frequencies. So these were abnormalities that then could serve um, as markers. We looked at the EEG activity for epileptiform activity, and what we found is that the black six mice, as well as F1 mice, which 
were mice generated with the, um, with the deletion and then a mixed 129 and black six background. And both of those animals, um, we, we felt that it was more robust in the black six animals, showed these bursts of polyspike activity. And they lasted about two to two and a half seconds. They didn't, the animals didn't demonstrate any tonic-clonic type of seizure activity. However, it's possible that if if we were able to test them maybe in a learning paradigm or um, in humans, you know, we give them a test word or we give them a command and with, I mean, this has sort of an absence type uh, pattern, a generalized polyspike pattern, and that can be associated with brief absences or sometimes blinking or myoclonic type seizures that are fairly subtle. So we're not sure if this is, it's long enough to be a seizure, um, and it's certainly epileptiform. We also looked at evoke seizures, and what I'm showing here is um, the audiogenic evoke seizure. And what we did with these animals um, is we put them in a chamber, and after, um, after they acclimated to the chamber, we then presented them with 140 decibel tone. So that's the tone. And you can, this is the wild type animal who does not have seizures, but you can see the wild running seizure and tonic clonic activity in the Angelman mouse. So, what's shown here is that when we looked at 129 mice, the black six mice did not show this phenotype. The, both the young animals um, had. Uh, had uh, um, audiogenic seizures. It increased the percentage of them that had them increased with age and actually one of the wild type animals had an audiogenic seizure when in the older animals none of the young animals did. So that's an important aspect of their seizure phenotype. We also looked at evoked seizures um, with canate and saw an increased threshold to canate seizures in the 129 animals, similar to what you saw um, from the Weber lab. So we performed continuous EEG recordings um, during the, the canate stimulation. And I'll show you those EEG traces, partly because it's much more dramatic, the seizures in the Angelman mice. Um, we also did chronic recordings one of the things that's known about canate-induced seizures is that while they induce acute status epilepticus, so an hour of continuous seizures or longer, um, the animals also, go, a certain percentage of them will go on to develop epilepsy, particularly in rats. In, in, in mouse models, it's not as robust. So if we saw the Angelman mice going on to develop epilepsy, that would be quite significant. And I'm not gonna show you these data, but we have in those recordings, we have found that a few of our Angelman mice actually do develop chronic epilepsy. But I'll show you the acute data from this one hour time point after canate. So this is an example of the type of seizure they eventually evolve into with the canate. And these seizures just happen one after another. Um, usually you have to give them a, an anticonvulsant to get them to stop seizing. So it's a mixed tonic-clonic generalized seizure. And what you see on EEG, once they go, so their baseline activity is shown here. And you can see the Angelman pre-canate in, induction so they ha this is just how they are at rest, is abnormal, higher in amplitude than, than the wild type. This baseline is markedly compressed. That's why it look, looks different than the earlier EEG I showed you. With the first seizure they have after canate, already the Angelman mice have a much, more, a much higher amplitude uh, seizure activity in their EEG trace. And then once they go into status epilepticus, that activity is much higher in amplitude. 
um, suggesting there's less inhibition and um, there's possibly recruitment of more cortical neurons, um, excitatory neurons. We really don't know the basis of this, but it would, I think, be inter interesting to pursue this on a molecular cellular level. What we found is that similar to what Ed showed you, and like I said at the beginning of this section, that the uh, Angelman mice, the 129 mice, had a decreased uh, um, latency to both the first seizure and what's shown here, status epilepticus. So they were more prone to seizures, earlier seizures, and, um, and, and a decreased, yeah, earlier seizures, earlier status epilepticus. So again, supporting that they're more seizure prone uh, compared to wild type animals. So just to summarize, um, we looked at three backgrounds, the F1, which is the cross of 129 black six with the AS mutation, then the mutation on a black six background and a 129 background. And um, in terms of just the EEG trace itself and spectral power, it seemed that the black six um, had abnormalities that potentially would correlate with their behavioral deficits that are known. And I'll, I'll show you a summary of that in the, in the next couple of slides. And they also have the generalized polyspikes, possibly representing seizures. We're not sure at this point. Um, whereas the 129s are valuable in that they have audiogenic seizures that uh, in, in the mutant animals, as well as um, an increased susceptibility to canate. So it seems with EEG and epilepsy studies that both strains um, would be valuable expressing the mutation. We characterize these animals behaviorally, and because of time, I'm not gonna go into um, all of the study, all, all of the individual results. I'll show you a summary slide. But we had a series of studies um, over 10 days, and we performed the studies in each of these backgrounds in order to figure out what the, what the optimal strain would be for black six. Going into these studies, um, Previous data had suggested it would be the black six, and indeed, the most robust behavioral phenotype, as expected, was the black six, and uh, they had both decreased locomotor activity in open field. Um, marble bearing is um, a, a task that looks at repetitive behavior. That was abnormal in these animals, um, as well as um, looking at motor coordination and motor activity on wire hang and rotor rod. So next, we felt like we were ready to screen um, therapeutics. And um, I think we've already discussed that the, the FAST FIRE team interacts weekly and sometimes more if needed, and there's a lot of um, interaction and guidance from the entire team as well as the board um, on our weekly calls. And it was felt that based on um, this, this neuron compound, NNZ256, based on what had promising results in Fragile X and Rett syndrome, there was a push to look at this compound in the animal model. So um, it's, it's an interesting compound. Um, it's critical. Um, the, the, the compound is um, an analog of this um, insulin-like growth factor, and it's naturally occurring in neurons and, um, and the brain, and it's part of normal development. It's expressed in normal development. But it also seems to play a role in injury and stress responses. It seems to um, mediate inflammation, and um, it's seen in um, neuronal dendritic dysfunction, um, microglial dysfunction. So basically, an infl it's involved in inflammation or modulates inflammation. And like I said, there were both preclinical as well as clinical studies suggesting it was promising in two other um, neurodevelopmental disorders. So what we did is we used a paradigm of treatment that had been used in preclinical studies with Fragile X. We treated the animals for 10 days. 
and we did behavioral analyses, and then um, at the end of these studies, we did seizure stimulation. I'm, um, we, we did studies in all three backgrounds, but um, I think moving forward, we're probably not going to use all of the backgrounds, probably just the black six and 129, black six for behavior and 129 and black six for seizures and EEG studies. Um, but just, just to summarize what we saw, um, this, this just is an overview of, of the series of tests that we performed. I'll show you the results of a few of these. Um, like I said, we got negative data in open field. There was no rescue of the um, hypoactive locomotor activity in um, the AS mice um, treated with vehicle versus the neuron compound. Um, we also found that the changes in uh, the marble bearing task, there was no rescue in the vehicle versus NNZ treated animals, and uh, the drug had no effect on behavior in wild type. We also uh, found that um, similar to what the Weber lab had shown is that the AS mice have um, a decreased time on the rotor rod, and there was no uh, rescue with the NNZ compound. We looked at audios, audiogenic and canate induced seizures. What's shown here are the results with audiogenic seizures. So uh, these are the AS mice. Um, the, the two treatment groups, vehicle versus NNZ, um, had um, similar uh, um, seizures in the um, audiogenic um, induction, and none of the wild type had uh, seizures. And there was no change in the time uh, to tonic-clonic, um, as well as wild running seizures. So basically, um, we found there was no behavioral rescue or rescue in the seizure phenotypes um, of the AS mice in treatment with this agent. Um, there potentially are other things we, we can look at um, in, in considering this compound, but um, we're also ready to move on to screening other compounds. We, we heard um, and other treatments. We heard about some of these this morning and um, you know whether or not um, the fast fire group is, um, it, it depends on, on how we want to move forward, but we certainly can do additional EEG studies with, uh, with the um, dietary, with the dietary uh, ketone ester compound, um, but also move on to other agents. We're really, I'm really excited about um, being involved in characterizing seizures and epilepsy in other models, such as the pig model. Um, I think that could be very promising. And for um, EEG and neurophysiology studies, having a larger animal and more cortex to record from um, is a lot easier in terms of performing EEG. So um, I, I, I think those can potentially be very promising um, in terms of screening for the epilepsy phenotype. Some of the other um, studies that we're interested in doing in just characterizing the mice and then potentially using as biomarkers would be um, scoring sleep. And if we see a sleep phenotype in the mutant animals, we can potentially um, screen agents and even look at NNZ effects on sleep. And we can hopefully potentially do that with EEG tracings that we already have. Um, we're looking at, we're interested in looking at inflammation in the animal model. Um, there's some, um, there's data already published suggesting that this is one candidate mechanism uh, to target in Angelman, and we know that um, um, agents such as minocycline that have proven useful in, in some of the Angelman um, patients targets inflammation, so it seems worth looking at that, especially at the dendrites and um, um, in, in areas critical for learning and memory like hippocampus, and um, that would that's the last point here. And then to use all of these as biomarkers um, for screening novel therapeutics. 
And I think many of these um, aspects of the phenotype that I've talked about here and that Ed's talked about as well um, would be uh, valuable to screen in, in a higher mammal such as the pig. So that brings me to my acknowledgement slide. And um, I couldn't have done this work without the fast fire funding. Um, like I said at the beginning of the talk, I was not a lab uh, set up and up and running with Angelman mice already in my lab. So we had to um, re-derive the mice and get them in our animal facility, learn how to genotype and then phenotype them. Um, and it's been a really exciting and interesting road doing this. Um, my uh, collaborators are amazing. Um, they, every time we talk, there's already always interesting um, discussions and debates. And um, really, uh, the research um, is very dynamic. And there's interaction with the board. And um, it moves forward at a quick pace. And it's really driven by the Fast Fire team and the board and all of you um, with your input. And of course, um, our children and adults with Angelman and the, their amazing families, um, and really worldwide. Um, I mean, you, you, in the case here, physically you hold hands, but I think you, you know, you share, you share your stories and um, studies that are ongoing or are in the works with each other um, internationally, and, and it's really very remarkable um, through your website, through social media. And I got to experience part of this international um, uh, connection um, through uh, a trip this fall with part of the Fast Fire team um, going to Australia to, to, the Fast, to the Fast Australia meeting. And um, one of the highlights was really getting to spend time with those families and those investigators and doctors taking care of the patients. And uh, Scott and I got invited to, um, to go to a kangaroo koala bear petting zoo with one of the developmental pediatricians and her patients siblings with Angelman syndrome and their parents and they had annual passes to the park and so we actually got to pet one of the kangaroos um, of course dr. Weber was invited but he was busy reviewing grants <laughs> I think he had study section coming up when he got home so I, I want you to know that um, you you motivate us you inspire us as, as the fast fire team you inspire me in my clinical work, and and as a mother, you as a parent, you inspire me. Um, and uh, of course, I want to acknowledge my lab members. Two of the main players in generating the data I showed you today are Heather Bourne and Ann Dow, and uh, they came into the study with some Angelman background, but also with background in behavior and EEG. And there are some other lab members that help with some of the surgeries and implantations, and then um, my institution. So thank you. I'll take questions. <laughs>